As you all know, um, this week we're having the Malta Mediterranean Literature Festival, and today's event is the first pre-festival event open to the public. During this evening's event, we would like to create a safe space to discuss literature and nature, at a time when natural spaces in our country are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. As we grow older, we perceive space to be shrinking as the outside world makes its way into our everyday life. The least thing we'd want, therefore, would be the further encroachment of, uh, uh, of upon our spaces by built-up areas. This very same week, we've witnessed how inaccessible and inhabitable our spaces have become. The sky is no longer for protection to protected birds, and the, the sea is throwing up lifeless turtles and sea slime from our fish farms. In this evening's discussion, we'll have a look at the duality of any between claustrophobic Malta and the vastness of other countries and our constant search for alternative spaces. How is this translated into our literature or literatures? What fixations regarding space occupy our literatures and in what ways? Emmanuel Mefsud will moderate today's session. The guest authors are Theodor Relshik from Malta and Roger West from the United Kingdom and France. We will start the discussion by watching Consumed Spaces, a short film by Martina Camilleri. The illustrations shown during the discussion are by Steve Bonello. Thank you.
reference, another source to, to uh, launch us into this evening's discussion. After this short clip we've, we've seen, some 40 years ago, I think, uh, one of our poets wrote a poem in reaction to a building which was six stories high. Six. In fact, the poem is called Six Stories by Maria Novella. And in this poem, he expresses how overwhelmed he feels and suffocated because of this very high building. Nowadays, we're planning to have um, towers <coughs> 24, 36 stories. So it's quite. But my point is that what we are complaining of today, some poets were already complaining about 40 years ago. Not to mention our national poet who had always uh, expressed how suffocated he feels in our cities in a time when there was not even a six story building. What would you make of this, given that poets had, were they foretelling a future with their writings? Uh, yes, I mean, it's not just 40 years ago that the poets were writing. I mean, um, if you go back to the tradition of English poetry, uh, go back to Blake, who wrote about dark satanic mills, um, hundreds of years ago, um, and you go back to Piers Plowman in the 13th century, Hundreds and hundreds of years ago in the UK, I can't speak for any other country, but in the UK, poets were uh, looking at the natural landscape and railing poetically against the despoiling of the landscape. Um, uh, in Blake's time, of course, they would talk about not so much several story buildings, but great factory chimneys that were reaching to the sky and darkening the landscape and darkening the skies and pumping out smoke. Um, so I think it's been a concern that poets have always had about the encroachment of um, man-made despoilation upon the natural landscape. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, obviously that's, that's all, that's all that, that's all true and something that's kind of ingrained into into what we expect from from poets and poetry in a sense maybe because of the popular conception or misconception that uh, romantic poetry equals all poetry and that that, that that's all there is all there is to poetry and i think ultimately uh, obviously it's not the poet's fault in and of themselves but i think ultimately this has been to the detriment of maybe some of the political edge that uh, one can uh, take from or expect to 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 um, to have in, in in terms of poetry as activism, because uh, we come to associate it with yes, a very uh, maybe romantic, with even a small R instead of capital R um, view on uh, on how we should treat and and uh, and look at the environment, because of course at the end of the day it's, it still remains a very human centric view of the environment of something that is there of nature. Of something that is there um, uh, to kind of uh, elevate the human soul. Let's put it that way. Obviously, with someone like William Wordsworth being being the chief representative of, of of something like that. So I think um, yes, it has always been something that that uh, poets and writers have gravitated towards. But um, the popular conception of it has, I think, not been terribly uh, terribly helpful to give it that necessary edge that we need. Or to move into proper uh, pro environment activism. In fact, uh, you're reminding me, Theo, with your reference to, to this romantic. Uh, there were, in fact, uh, a movement, there were, there were movements of poets who, on the contrary, I mean, the most obvious which would come to mind are the Italian futuristic, futurists who, who praised the, the machine rather than, than the, the natural environment. So if we were to if we were to take these two movements uh, and put them against the, the local scenario nowadays, 
would you write uh, a poem in praise of machinery? When you when you drive towards Lima and see all those cranes and what have you? Uh, I don't think I would write a poem that's explicitly praising that 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 machinery. But now that we have, especially you know, looking at it globally and looking at. Um, uh, other things that are happening, for example, the rise of artificial intelligence and uh, and that kind of thing, that you know yields up some interesting questions and opens up, I think, a space for for certainly some kind of creative exploration. Uh, I've kind of used that myself recently. Um, I've given myself that facility in the, in the project that I'm doing right now, which is a comic book called Mipdu, and I've actually decided that one of the planets in this science fiction comic book will be a highly technologized sort of cyborg uh, society. Um, the details of it don't feature, the, the sort of internal mechanics of it don't feature as much in the comic itself, partly because I haven't been bothered to like world build in so much detail yet. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work to create a planet from scratch. But, you know, I, I think there is there are interesting questions we can ask in terms of, you know, agency, um, yeah, after a certain point, technology ceases to become uh, something that's that's purely there to, to extend, to facilitate our own dreams, maybe to have its own internal logic. And then, I mean, these aren't new questions, of course. I mean, science fiction has been raising them pretty much since its, its conception. But um, now that science fiction is becoming science fact, um, I'm starting to think, okay, maybe even writing about the internet and the, the spaces and the, you know, internal alleyways of the internet, is that a kind of new nature poetry? Because those spaces are becoming the spaces we inhabit now. So uh, I think that, uh, that is, the, that is the, the, possibly the new development that's happening. Because of course then you see, if you're talking about what romantic poets wrote about, you know, and, and maybe even slightly later, the Industrial Revolution, where you know, the satanic mills and their successors were much more evident. Now things are becoming much more, obviously even more evident in some ways, as you mentioned the example of the six stories morphing into 30 stories, but uh, things are becoming more sleek, more nano, more integrated into our lives. And I think these are interesting themes for any writer, you know, for better or for worse, whether for society, they certainly offer up a, a space for, for, for creativity, for creativity, yeah. I guess, like, like Teo, I, I don't think I'd uh, write a poem in praise of great cranes and uh, concrete blocks going up. What I might do, of course, is notice the interplay of light, or the shadows, or how the light changes, um, or how the colours change, um, how new species, of, how, 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 how birds and species of plants are also encroaching upon these concrete blocks as well and notice things like that um, and that might set off a poem so I might use, um, utilise, use and subvert uh, some of these urban landscapes in order to um, um, look at um, something in a, in, a, in a different way and also make connections between the urban landscape and the, and the natural landscape. Um, as I said, how animals and birds are interacting and how human beings are interacting with these, these new landscapes. And um, the, and Teo mentioned about the internet as a space for, um, as a space we now inhabit. Um, I'm also interested in those poets who write about um, psychogeography, like Kenneth White from Brittany and Ian Sinclair from the UK, who look at those maps we carry around, those connections, those lines we carry around in our heads, and they always remind me of, of those, um, uh, those, those Wi-Fi lines that, um, um, that, uh, that connect us all these days. So there are new connections being forged, and new connections which we can use to um, subvert um, what is politically happening to us um, uh, with the um, uh, with these new landscapes that are being forced upon us. One moment. Um, so, do I get you? Do I get you uh, that you're trying to tell us that it's not all negative? 
you ask about both. <laughs> uh, well, it's I don't think it's about negative or positive. Is 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 essentially what we're what certainly what I'm saying. What I can imagine Roger maybe is also getting at. It's that uh, simply that there are new realities to the idea of development that aren't simply tied to physical development of, of buildings, but um, that are also uh, have to do with smaller but more insidious and intrusive technologies. And this can be, in fact, even more disturbing uh, than, than the previous uh, encroachments. Uh, we can certainly talk about how, yes, uh, not, you know, before, okay, you had a six-story building, but you could go into a field and be completely away from any form of technology. Now we take our phones with us, there's Wi-Fi connections everywhere, Google has mapped everything. So uh, it's, there's new concerns, uh, certainly, and the only, the only reason why it's in the forefront of my mind is that you spoke about you know, the, uh, how previous poets reacted to that. And I think now we actually need to, if anything, we need to attune ourselves and be, be more vigilant about how these technologies work. Uh, yes, I suppose we, we have a responsibility to engage with our environment and to engage also politically. And I think there's a political struggle um, that is to be made um, um, when we are faced with the uh, what seems to be an impending ecological Armageddon. Um, but we have to engage with not that as some sort of outside force that uh, uh, we can't control, but the political um, the political forces, the, the people who are in power, the political forces, the, uh, the capitalist networks that are, um, are causing this, and we have to engage with that. As poets, we have to be opportunistic. You know, we're not saying it's, not saying it's positive or negative, it's just something that's different. It's, we have to be opportunistic, and we write about these things. As poets, we have a duty to use our imaginations, which, as Baudelaire says, was the greatest of senses. Um, and to use these things to make all kinds of different connections and flights of fancy, if you will. Um, when you look at some of the 19th century British English uh, uh, writing about landscape, you look at something like John Clare, for example. John Clare didn't write about vast landscapes. He wrote about microcosms of landscapes. Um, when he was incarcerated in a, a hospital, a mental hospital in Epping Forest, he escaped and he set out to walk back to Northampton, which was about 60 miles away. And he was very distressed because the landscapes he was walking through to get back to his hometown were alien to him because he was focusing on the minutiae. Uh, and he said it was, his phrase was, it was out of his knowledge. I think as poets, we have to write out of our knowledge. Um, you want to add something to this? All right. But at the, at the same time, um, on our newspapers, on TV, um, chat shows, whatever, um, we tend to, to, to keep listening the same the same thing going on, that basically we're losing all the space we live in, and the, the untold message is that basically this is all wrong, that we're, we're basically, uh, this is all gloom and doom. Is there anything which you would say or think or tell us in reaction to this doom? Yes, certainly. I mean, uh, again, the, the project I mentioned, the, the comic that I mentioned, was literally spurred into action because I was, I felt really completely powerless in the in the, the wake of all of these all of these developments. Uh, in particular, it was the the American University project at uh, at Zonor that really made me think, okay. Um, and obviously, there's only so much uh, Facebook ranting that you can do, and uh, and. Uh, and, and, and so on, and you know, we're constantly told that uh, you know, any kind of action is useless. It's not, of course, as we, as subsequently, actually, I think this, was, for better or for worse, from my viewpoint, obviously, for the, for, for the better, that particular episode, or not to be quite a tipping point in some ways, 
in terms of whether or not you know it's it's yielded uh, any any significantly concrete change is up to debate. I think it has no pun on concrete, of course. There, um, but uh, it, the fact is that yes, this project happened because I felt so powerless against all these kind of things. And of course, um, but then of course Roger mentioned opportunist. I tied the opportunist uh, tag also in terms of the aesthetic pleasures one gets in, in writing and uh, you can find these pleasures everywhere. To motivate yourself to finish something you need to, I think, find some kind of per even perverse appeal in, in, in something like this. So making a, a very sort of um, over the top, obviously not at all subtle um, comic book, um, deliberately so, was uh, was something that that was motivated by all of this and 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 the kind of blowing this up to the situation the multi situation up to a grotesque extent extending it to three alien planets <laughs> for one thing um, was a way that yes I, I for me personally you know to channel these frustrations uh, and to hopefully yes continue the debate in my own way because this is what I can contribute as a writer other people can have different talents and they can maybe maybe they're better at organizing protests or or whatever and so I feel that yes this was my stake and as just as a pure kind of almost physical action that was my contribution so um, contribution towards what towards the you know towards the debate towards the the, the as my own version of a, of a kind of political action um, also because I saw a gap that, again, to use a kind of mercenary language, um, in terms of what was being done, I mean, uh, yes, you had lots of poets, you had lots of writers writing in a kind of realist mode, social realist mode, uh, addressing this with satire and so on. I decided to do it in a kind of very, uh, again, over the top science fiction, uh, it's essentially a coming of age story, but with I mean, the Prime Minister in my story is called Prime Minister Robert Barron. <laughs> so I, I, my one rule was no subtlety, uh, no realism. There's going to be giant monsters in it. There's going to be all sorts of... Uh, which, of course, I just... It's simply what I enjoy as well. You know, what I, what I look for in, in, in a lot of the fiction that I read. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's the, the old saying of and, you know, each one to their own ability. You know? And so I kind of took that as my, as my cue. I guess, and I'm just picking up on Taylor's point about powerlessness. Um, yes, we are, we, are, we are powerless unless we act, uh, agitate politically. Um, uh, we can maybe change things. But as poets, um, what we do is, the world we inhabit is, is a world of using imagination, but also making different connections, different links, thinking in a different way. And the more that we write, promote, talk about, create a world of poetry, the more we can encourage people to think in different ways and not to accept what's given to them, the arguments, the statements, um, um, the images that are presented to them. We can, we, can, we can hope, rather than sort of say to them, you must do this, you must do that, we can just, by creating a world where, where creative and poetic thinking becomes more of the norm rather than the exception, we can hope that people will resist um, what is being fed to them and not be so powerless. Roger, in the UK a few years ago there was this movement towards reclaiming the streets. What of it nowadays? How, how did it develop or not develop? Well, the, the, the Reclaiming the Streets movement was, uh, we also saw it at the Occupy movement in Hong Kong and uh, various cities in the US. It was, it was, you know, it was, it was a worldwide movement. In the UK, um, it's a very good point, Manny, because in the UK, um, the, a lot of the struggle has, there was certainly a struggle in the 19th century about the right um, to roam in public spaces. And we have, um, in the 1820s, really, around the 1820s there were the enclosure acts which um, allowed landowners just to um, 
take over land which prior to that had been public land. The same thing is now happening in our cities in the United Kingdom. Um, not so long ago I was walking down to, um, I was walking with a friend down to, uh, down to the River Thames through a very old part of London with sort of narrow streets and our way was blocked by a huge building that was built right across the street. Uh, now we could either go around the building or we could walk through it. Um, we tried to walk through it, we were turned back. Um, we were told it's not a public thoroughfare anymore. It, it was owned, it was, um, it was a building that was sold to a Bahrain insurance company. Uh, and curiously enough, what we could do, there was a big desk in the middle of the foyer, we could walk up to the desk and then we had to walk back the same way. From, or we could walk around the other side and we could walk to the desk from the other side and then walk back the same, same way. What we then did was actually to walk through to the desk and then walk a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further till they stopped trying to stop us. Um, and our city streets are being taken over, public parks are being taken, taken over by commercial enterprises. What were city squares, what were public squares have now become uh, guarded and grilled shopping centres patrolled by security guards. Um, and our space has been taken over. And yes, there, 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 has, there, there are sporadic attempts to reclaim these urban public spaces. Um, but they, they as you'll get greeted with tear gas and water cannons. Um, um, but it's a very, very powerful thing, the, you know, the, the, the taking over of our city streets, where, where people used to walk and just walk uh, purposely to go to one place to another, or just walk to think, to meet people. Um, uh, that possibility is now being denied us. Um, at our London, along with other, other UK cities, we have lost those spaces in which we can be social human beings. And we are retreating now, as Theo said, to uh, our interiors, the interior, the interior spaces, um, and create those worlds um, online rather than actually talk and meet people. The crackdown of, of use of social spaces was um, under Margaret Thatcher's government in the 1980s, who tried to ban too many people meeting together in one space because in case they then became insurrectionary and they marched on Parliament and tried to burn it down. Uh, but now these spaces are not controlled by the government, they're, they're controlled by, by banks, uh, worldwide banks and businesses um, that have no uh, connection at all with the city. With that. And literally, this bank was just it's a Bahrain bank, it was just plonked, like it just fallen from the sky. It was just plonked down across this street and people couldn't walk past it anymore. To a certain extent, this is happening also locally. You know, I was reading this morning that at the Hira Beach, there are, they have these deck chairs back to, to where they were some weeks ago and they were removed. How would you react? You're going to to, to swim and suddenly you find out that a public beach became basically usurped by, by someone. We'll talk about that someone later, but, you know... Um, yeah, yeah, how, I, how would I react? I mean, I would be obviously very, uh, very angry and, and, and taken aback by it, but I would be more taken aback, as tends to happen here, uh, by the, well, by the indifference of of, of, of others, apparently, uh, that has become more and more apparent here, at least, in, in, in Malta, um, because of, I guess, several several factors uh, that come into it. I mean, somebody is always always has somebody who is related to somebody who, is, who has an interest in, uh, in these developments, in these projects, and so on. Uh, maybe it's a country that's been trained to, to essentially be, be silent in the face of it, or to view it as as something positive because it brings about the, mo the modernity which we need so much of to get out of this idea of ourselves as being uh, a backwater little island, you know. So yeah, that's how that's how I would uh, that's how I would react. Again, um, the, the we did see something of a tipping point in awareness, which I think 
as you know, when contrasted to previous generations, or even not that long ago, we didn't have the internet as a, as a tool of simple organization. Uh, it, you know, it took something usually took something really in your face to get people to react. Now it's like so. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I feel less desperate as I felt I think in that moment when I, when you know, the comic came about, the, the spark that that, that that led to the comic, the the the, um, the American University project. Do you see this link between privatization of public space and this this process of confinement almost to your, all the time being confined to smaller and smaller spaces? Yeah, I think that's the that would be the kind of unfortunate and log but logical conclusion of of these kinds of things. And I think the the more people are are finding ways of being content in that confinement, you know, the, the, the whole amusing ourselves to death uh, thing comes to mind, the fact that we have so many devices that uh, enable us to remain happy while being confined in our homes, uh, obviously takes the edge off any kind of uh, activism you might be given towards in other, in, in other contexts. Yeah. Also, the, the reverse happens. Um, when these spaces are privatized, um, and you can see this in big cities um, all over the world, um, it's the people inside that become confined, because outside there's a seething mass of dirt and garbage and people like us roaming around like feral animals ready to, 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 to bite them if they, if they go out. And it's, it's, it's these people who, who are confined behind, behind cages in a life of luxury, albeit, but they are still confined. We can roam freely, sort of, um, but um, we don't have all those resources at our disposal. Every single day we hear of, we hear the news that some tree or a number of trees are being uprooted to have wider streets, wider roads, easier traffic. Everyone would like to arrive to his or their work fast, so what's the problem with uprooting trees that we, you know? I guess the main problem is that there isn't enough of them to begin with, so the uprooting feels like uh, a step too far. Um, I'm just confused by it because we have examples in Malta where trees work and offer benefit. I mean, I think of Valley Road, for example, which, you know, offers a canopy of shade, which is much needed in a hot country like Malta, but that doesn't seem to cross them. I, and again, it's an issue of short-termism, it's an issue of, I think, yeah, not, not, not having, uh, the, certainly not the will, I don't know if intelligence is an issue here, I'm guessing the people in charge of this do have an idea of how this could work, but because of their own, uh, I guess, lowered expectations of how things should work, it, it, it goes the way, the way we're seeing it go. Um, so I think that is mainly the problem, is the fact that the, uh, the starting point is already worrying and we're, you know, so any further encroachment feels like, feels like a red alert in some way, feels like a red alarm. Uh, the notebook I write in is, is, is made from trees and uh, this pencil that I carry around, that's made from trees as well. Without trees there wouldn't be any poetry uh, and or, or we'd have to go like the ancient Sumerians and be writing out poems of chisels, sharp stones on bits of rock. So, save the trees. Um, Alright, let's go to the who is creating all this. And of course, once we start looking at who, we have to inevitably talk about politics and economics. Is this part of a huge capitalist uh, structure or it wouldn't make any difference of who's ruling the, the world basically? I know, both of you. Well, I mean, we, you know, it, it, there, is, there is a huge capitalist structure and um, there are all so sorts of structures within these structures and hidden structures underneath those structures um, that are allowing this to happen. Um, 
the banks, the insurance companies, the offshore developers, the, the, the um, tax havens, the people who run tax havens, they're, they're all, whether or not they're all, um, it's a conspiracy and they are setting out like some evil villain in a James Bond film to destroy life as we know it, is, is a good point. But certainly these things feed off each other, the, these, these people, um, these institutions are like um, little creatures that feed off each other, incessantly feeding off each other um, and regurgitating stuff and other people are feeding off that. Um, and they are enabling this to happen. So there is, you know, the, the, with the increasing um, ability of large companies now to um, have worldwide dominance, and the fact that these companies, their, their dealings are hidden. They have good lawyers, they have offshore tax companies, they have all sorts of secret ways of hiding what they're actually doing and hiding the money they're making. Um, without this happening, with, with, with all this, it's becoming increasingly hard to find out exactly who the villain is. You know, we can say, yes, it's international capitalism, but uh, who takes responsibility? Which international capitalist door do we go and hammer on and say, look what you're doing to our environment, stop it now. And you say, well, yeah, sorry, I realised, well, I'll stop it now. Um, but it is being bolstered, it's not, just, it's not just these companies. These companies couldn't do this were it not for the connivance and support of governments um, um, who are allowing these companies under the, um, I suppose, in the argument, using the argument that they are uh, protecting, yeah, they are, these companies are protecting the economy, these, co these companies, through their economic development, the top-down trickle development uh, idea, uh, that they are, um, this is good for all of us. Um, and it's these go and it's governments that are supporting this. And I don't want to get into local politics, but um, um, you're most welcome. To. What? You're most welcome. To. I'm. I'm okay. Well, uh, members of government who are benefiting personally from this. Um, so um, the political and the economic uh, world of, of international capitalism are meshed and feed off one another. One of our poets. Uh, Roger, one of our poets, because we're talking about the who now. Um, Victor Fenech, he writes this poem about the, the loss of space. And then he ends the poem uh, by making this appeal to stop this. But then he continues by saying, well, it's not what I want that counts, but what they want. And they he means very obviously the governments and the construction lobbies and what have you. You talked about uh, subverting earlier on. Do you still have hope? And then I'll ask the same question to you, of course. In a word, yes. Because I believe in the power of... I believe in the power of... I mean, not to sound a bit evangelical. Friends, I believe in the power of poetry. And, uh, but I believe that um, there is a way that, and I mean, there are little movements in the world. I mean, you talked about the Occupy movement. That's just a little thing. When you look at the people who are um, protesting against Donald Trump right across, the, you know, the groups of people, the African American people, women, um, significant groups of people whose voices are being heard, and the more these voices are being heard. Tony mentioned about the internet. The internet's great in, um, yes, it's, it's, it's a, a tool of, um, for advertising companies to, to make us buy things we don't want, but it's also subverting it. It's also a way that we can make connections, we can get information around, we can, we can create rallies, we can, get, we can create demonstrations. Um, so yes, I do have hope, because I think people will always say, no, this is enough. Um, you talked about there comes a point when, when uh, yeah, people collude up to a certain point um, and they say, and then they say no. There will, will be, always be people who say, no, this is enough, not in my name, you don't talk to me, you don't act for me, uh, you, uh, you're, 
you're not my government, you don't represent me, uh, this is enough. And they will stand up and say so. Yeah, um, well, I don't know if I can really uh, talk about hope in the explicit way that Roger has, but I, I'll, I'll certainly say that if there is no art in protest to this, that would be much worse. Um, my, again, my motivation in this regard is to maybe try to push for more, uh, again, more, more popular or even populist, I guess, uh, examples of it. I mean, because at the end of the day, uh, a Booker Prize winning novel or an award winning poem is, let's face it, only going to reach a particular audience uh, with a particular mindset. It'll be preaching to the converted in a, in a lot of ways. Um, so I would I would like to see more um, uh, more popular mediums doing this. Uh, in terms of, for example, the, 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 the especially now that Hollywood is essentially, for example, run by two corporations. Um, and again, I, I, we mentioned capitalism earlier being responsible for for these things. Capitalism is also very good at adapting to to certain uh, trends, even. Uh, certain apparently, um, uh, how shall we put it, uh, trends related to social justice. I mean, Black Panther was one of the most best, you know, highest grossing films of the last year, and it was seen as a kind of progressive move. But of course, the underpinnings of that are, you know, they figured out that they could make money off of that gap, essentially. But uh, my dream kind of um, example is, well, I'm really glad I got to work this in, I wasn't sure I would is the first Robocop movie, <laughs> the very first Robocop, which uh, to me, as, as a friend of mine says, is, an, is a contradiction in terms, it's an example of, it's a great example of the Hollywood left. It is essentially a film about the privatization of the police force. I, it, is, it, it is a dystopian vision of, of, of kind of, uh, of capitalism being pushed to its extremes and of how subversion of that system happens, uh, you know, uh, it, from from the inside and the kind of again it's it's blown up to a grotesque degree and it's an action film in its own right you can just watch it as an, but the message is very much apparent so I think uh, yeah we should try to create an alternative to to, to the more uh, to the more popular mediums that aren't haven't been appropriated by the capitalist machine yet or that aren't simply dumbed down versions of whatever we're expecting to see. Uh, I have no idea how time we are allowed to stay here, but uh, it's, it's almost one hour. Uh, so I think we should uh, see if there's anyone from the floor who would like to comment, ask. Maybe our friends from, from abroad would like to uh, give us their experience about the subject and compare it to ours. Let me just add that I think that Maltese literature has still not tried to narrate the feeling of being, uh, of, of our space, of our private space being taken over. I think many of what we've, we've done until now is look out of the window and observe what's happening around us almost, almost as if it is not affecting us in a very private space. I think inevitably the next stage is going to be people writing about how uh, their sunlight is being taken away, about uh, their privacy being taken away uh, in, in all sorts of way, about their very personal space being taken away. and. It might be interesting for us to look at what people in similar situations have, have written about this sense of being dispossessed of our own freedom, not only freedom of movement, but even our, almost our freedom of, freedom of being. Yeah, I think it's going to happen soon. Um, I've thought about 
about what you're saying a lot, uh, and Roger mentioned psychogeography earlier, and that is something that that very that does interest me a lot too. And, and I've had conversations with people like you know Alex, Alex Villager is in the audience, and I know he is he's interested in, in that strand of literature as well. And uh, as somebody who walks who walks a lot, or at least used to walk quite a bit around around again not the most beautiful areas of Mota even you know there is a kind of uh, dark occult <laughs> magic I think one finds in these really cramped streets and dirty streets especially at night when when you know they cease to function and cease to fulfill their function and there's a plenty of these ghost towns and for example the, the the industrial area of San Juan is an incredibly interesting and creepy place even during the day I think especially during the day so yes, I think there is, you know, once we, yeah, there, there will always be that strand of Modi's literature that will, that will, and rightly so, be effectively protest literature against overdevelopment. But I think, yes, there is the, the scope for, the, for what you're saying, and I look forward to, to seeing it happen. And also, so also the um, Adrian Benchy people being, feeling dispossessed. Uh, one thing that, the, it's easy to make people feel dispossessed when you take away their identity, you take away their history, you take away their roots. Um, as I was mentioned in the introduction, I live most of the time in France, and one of the things that's different in France is the, the, is the concept of terroir. Um, that's, as John Berger put it, lives lived vertically. Um, and even, I think if you go back to Tennyson, Tennyson talked about the plough the plow that tills the field, then lies beneath, uh, and it's that sense of uh, where we came from, what's beneath, the layers that are beneath us, the historical and physical layers that are beneath us, and if we can recognise that and be in touch with that, we will feel, I think, that we have more of a space in the world, even if it's a vertical space rather than a horizontal space. Um, and there's a lot of poetry about that, poets, a lot of poets, Right, very effectively about that. People are writing things down, I'm sure they've got questions. <laughs> I like that. Uh, well, I, I understand a little what you say, but only a little. I want to. It's for the record. For the recognition, okay. So, uh, just I don't uh, speak sufficiently uh, English to understand what you say. I understand a little, I understand about what. And uh, uh, it's about environment and uh, poetry. Uh, uh, I, I think um, I you, the first thing uh, Karl Marx wrote. It's about uh, people who cannot uh, take wood because. There is fences, mm. and uh, uh, people uh, have to move from their country, go away. And we are confident, and uh, we have moved from the place we where we lived before. Uh, a bird sing in a forest, and we have a song who take place in this forest, and uh, a human, it's the same thing. But not even, uh, because we all have moved from our natural place and uh, invent another way of life. And we are in a big machine, capitalism is a big machine, and we are inside. We are like a piece of it, this machine, and by the way, we have a, lot of, a, a little freedom. And uh, we try to... Um, 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 
we try to not be um, destroyed. We see all animals disappear, animals very beautiful in picture. You see the panda, panda uh, in English the same thing. Panda, you see there is 100 panda, but there is on the years, um, um, years by years, there is a um, million picture of this panda. It's always the same picture of the same panda. <laughs> and uh, in a few time, uh, we are going to be embarrassed. Um, um, there is an undone of panda. Panda, and we are we are about okay. Uh, when we we walk, we are sure you not put your foot on a sheet of panda. It's finished, okay? Now we are can see panda is picture. Picture are quite beautiful, and in internet we can see all the nature, but there is quite no nature outside of the picture now. And. Uh, um, how can we sing in this place, in this strange place? I think we have strange song because we live in strange place now. Um, uh, we have to thank you, the capitalists, for this because this is very, this can be a very beautiful song. You see, I think we are like. Uh, nuclear nuclear central uh, humans, we can stop it. We are uh, radioactive like them, but we make very beautiful cloud. Um, I'm a bit, yes, I don't want to be a radioactive cloud. <laughs> uh, I just want to go back to um, for me, poetry is about being universal, about the universal, and about our identities and the communities that we belong to. And it's the job of poets, I think, to find the cracks, so to remind us about our history and where we come from and what we can identify with. Um, and it's it's the subversion that people like Taylor engage in, you know. Um, and that's very important. We haven't really talked about the past and about things being seasonal. There's something about the seasonal aspects of things that give me a link, anyway, to the past and the people I identify with. Sometimes they're this generation, sometimes they're six generations back. Um, in, in times like that. Um, and of course, I want to tell you a story about Roger and I were in uh, Belgium. Uh, in Brussels, and we we were standing like old, fumbling old tourists outside of um, a big building, and we were approached by two very good-looking young people who came and said, "Can we have our photograph taken with you because we believe we will be you in the future?" <laughs> and that was just a stunning thing to do, and very poetic. Hi, I'm going to be negative, sorry. Um, you would really. <laughs> in which way does a poem stop the Malta Developers Association from getting what they want? Or a novel, or anything else? My, I get the sense that the role of, as that lady was saying just now, the role of the artist, of the poet, of the writer is not to stop anything, but just to watch, except when he or she is suffering a, an immediate existential threat, like Adrian Grima over here, who lives in Pembroke, as far as I, as I think so, and his, the area where he's living is actually being threatened with um, a monstrous development. Otherwise, I've, I've, 
I don't see how art can really change anything, really. We don't live in a world of artists. Um, unless the artists decide to be more proactive and drop their pen and pick up something else. Because, really, I don't know... I mean, I love poetry, I'm a writer myself, but... The poet you quoted who wrote about the six-story building... I mean, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> there are even higher buildings now. But what did this poem do? Nothing. It just filled a page and some people read it and were moved, maybe. It's important to move people. It's essential. But, I mean, there has to be more, you know? We can't just talk and talk about how great our poetry is if we really want things to change. If we're feeling helpless, we can write out the helplessness. But again, the Malta Developers Association are not writing, po are not writing poems. You know, they're writing more powerful things, actually. No, I, I agree with you completely, and it's, it's what I was getting at when I said that um, maybe it's not about hope, but it's but I would still feel it's a lot worse if we didn't have some kind of testimony to what, to what happened. I mean, even the poem about the six-story building, at least it gave us, you know, a, a very clear reference point now. And yes, I mean, Adrian's work in, in Pembroke, the, the results that are achieved there are not tied to his poetry necessarily, they're tied to the very real activism that, that has taken place. So no, I, I don't think uh, anyone can believe that uh, poetry or any kind of art is some sort of direct magic bullet solution to, to, to any of these things. But it's one avenue we have to communicate about these things and uh, for what it's worth, it's, it, it's there. Which is also part of the reason why I think we should widen that avenue as much as possible to other media, other, other, other modes that, that will hopefully reach even more people. So, so yes, I mean, uh, in some ways they've just become gilded, gilded versions of our Facebook rants. Um, but, uh, but I think that, you know, it just still happens, certainly. Um, yes, I agree. I, I think that, um, as you say, poetry in itself, a poem in itself, is not going to change anything. Monsanto is not going to stop plowing up the landscape, or Shell's not going to stop uh, deep frying polar bears up in the Arctic just because I write a sonnet about it. And I'm going to say, oh God, there's a sonnet, you know, that says, we should stop this now, let's just close down our operations completely um, and, uh, and, and plant wild flowers instead. That's not going to happen. But um, as Theo said, you know, we have a responsibility to bear witness to this. Even if we can't stop it, we can we can make as many people as possible aware of this, uh, of what's going on um, through our writings. And we can, we can be the witnesses. I mean, if you look back at the poets of ancient Greek times, you know, they bore witness to all sorts of things they couldn't stop. They couldn't have it, they didn't have any power to stop, but they witnessed. And these things happen again and again. There are forces of oppression, um, forces uh, that will try and control us and um, suck the very being out of us. But if we know that this, is, this goes on and on and on over the years and that those forces will try and find different ways to do that, we can be alert to this, we can be aware of this. Um, and as poets, we can, we can bear witness, we can, we, can, we can hold up the testimonies about this. Um, just to build on this latter part of the discussion, what um, Alex said, I think the, the problem is a bit deeper than that, in the sense that you can't pretend to be a witness as an author or as a writer when you are also complicit. Um, I think the, the, uh, the authors come and uh, people practicing literature come from the same class that is actually motivating and running most of the development that we're seeing around us. Um, uh, there was a speech recently by, not a speech, but an intervention by the head of the 
architecture faculty at university, and he said, very often we blame architects for what we see around us, but actually they are responding to what their clients are asking. And what we see around us in terms of development is what is the cumulative effect of everybody's demand on, you know, based on their lifestyle and their expectations. So, um, uh, it's, I, I think it would be more useful for literature to be a bit more, let's say, uh, well, to reflect this kind of very complicated relationship that we have with reality in the sense that there isn't really some kind of grassroots movement that is completely outside of this dynamic that can reflect from the outside on what is happening. It is, it is us um, in our different identities. You know, um, uh, so so uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit difficult to say, let's be a witness to this and we have a responsibility because that responsibility is completely betrayed when you are actually looking for a house or trying to build a livelihood or trying to interact economically with what's happening around you. And, uh, and that is where the crux of the whole thing no, it is. So, so I think you're right um, that we all collude on different levels. Uh, we all tapped into this include on different levels. Um, but we we can still resist this and we can we can we can as writers we can write about our collusion, we can write about the complexities of this of this dynamic and I think that's that's what we can do as writers. I'm not quite sure I agree with you. I mean, I agree with what you're saying, 100%, that we're all complicit, but I'm not sure that that kind of then um, excludes us from being witnesses. I mean, a lot of the writers we keep referencing throughout history were horrible people, but they wrote beautifully about a number of things and incisively about a number of things. Uh, of course, uh, writing about this collusion uh, makes for more complex work and more honest work and I think we should see more of it but I'm not quite on board with your idea that there should be a kind of cohesive uh, hole inside this person before they can start uh, they can start commenting I think we all take for granted our many and I think in as opposed to for example uh, uh, being a politician uh, in theory or be or, or you know writing writing a a historical account or writing something, uh, a political pamphlet or, or whatever, with, with literature you can, you know, exist in that space. I think if we take away that from, from literature, I think we're, 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 we're poorer for it. I mean, The Merchant of Venice is a very self-contradicting text, but, you know, that internal contradiction is part of, is part of what makes it so great. So, I'm not quite sure I'm on board with that. I joined the pessimist club <laughs> and I suggest poets to write about confinement as a comfortable space because the next generation that I see, um, actually if I, don't, I, I don't think she would mind if I call Lydia Chiveras who once told me that in Malta the people who built houses in the 80s especially built big houses as we know, big, huge terraced houses because they left public space, that was the 80s. So now, um, that people are being driven into smaller homes, um, the, most of the public spaces that are left now are um, shopping centers and you know, the rest of it. And I feel that because I'm also in education, and I see young people in front of me every day, um, they are more comfortable in those spaces than they are in, in the countryside, what was left of it. So, yes, I suggest you, you practice <laughs> writing and, and being in confined spaces because that's where people want to be. If they go abroad, they go shopping. And, and um, I, I know that there is graffiti and there are movements like you know, Adrian's that are trying to storm the process, but the process is there. Malta is becoming a big city. And the dose of by, you know, bipartisan politics is there. You, you can't avoid the discussion that's in spite of, of, of the Facebook rants. 
we are an echo chamber, I'm sorry to say. Hi. Uh, I'm very glad you brought up, uh, this person brought up education, because I think what is important in water is uh, that we need to face the reality and the fact we potentially <coughs> lack creativity uh, when it comes to many aspects. And this comes, I think, from the way we are taught at school. We are not taught uh, to uh, challenge our teachers at all. Uh, this comes as a, it, it's more like someone is indoctrinating us, or someone is instructing us and we have to learn things by heart. Uh, and, and this, I think, is, is where poetry can help because and writing in general, creative writing can help because it can bring people to think in a different way rather than be instructed of what to learn. And uh, you brought up the, the architect. I believe, yes, it's true that they have uh, clients going to them and telling them this is what we would like because this is what everything is. But I think they have a duty to show an alternative and that comes also I'm afraid I work at university, I don't see it much uh, when I go into a lecture room. Uh, I, I see a somewhat a lack of people trying to challenge what I'm trying to uh, teach. Uh, or rather lecture, I don't like to call lecture I mean, teaching, it's not. Uh, and I would like architects to challenge themselves rather than not. And uh, I think that the whole point of poetry is that it can offer uh, this opportunity to, to, to show a creative aspect and, and maybe make think, people think, not necessarily out of the box, but just think. Yeah, I'll go one step further with the education uh, argument. Uh, I think the problem starts, starts quite early, not just in terms of uh, students not being encouraged to critically engage with their with their teachers, but also the the way things are taught is uh, tends to be done at least from what I remember in a very fragmented um, and very yeah with the exam results being the end result of it instead of this more um, encompassing approach, which then of course you, you you don't engage with with the environment and and with nature because you don't feel you're, like you're part of an ecosystem. You simply feel like you you are you have these dis disparate uh, aspects in your life that you need to cater to, and I think that I'm, I'm trying not to use the word word holistic because I hate it, but <laughs> that's kind of what we're um, uh, that's what we lose. Uh, and in order to really think about the environment in a way that is not just about re uh, relaxation or decoration. Um, you, I think you really need to be attuned to it as something that's literally part of you. I mean, we're seeing it now with climate change and the effect and what climate, what what brought it about is this idea that okay, we'll just do our thing and ignore this until it becomes you know a problem that cannot be managed anymore. So yes, I would take that even even towards that level. Um, just one last thing, maybe. Um, this gentleman who has mentioned architects. Um, I wish architects could read poetry, or if they, if they can't be poets, if they can't write it, at least read it, maybe. Um, because, personally, I don't, I don't have anything against building, developing, I mean, but it's how, how they do it. It's like, you know, if we mentioned Tinia Point, for example, they started with one block, and then, okay, maybe one would, would have been enough, but then they built another one next to it, and they completely shut of the view of Valletta, wherever you look, I mean, you just see these, this, Theo mentioned grotesque, and it's just grotesque, and there's no other word for it. So it's like how the building is taking place, how? That's, that's uh, I think, the problem, where, where it lies. And, and, on, and on top of that, I have a shout. <laughs> I can't call out a shout. And on top of that, you're perfectly right. I could include, uh, we mentioned trees, but tradition, I mean, historically, trees were very sparse on the Maltese Island. I mean, if you look at the Titans of the St. John, they used to use them as landmarks. So, go tree wise, find a tree and turn left, <laughs> pretty much. But we don't even use green 
greenery in our buildings and everywhere else in the where you have tall buildings, look at the tall buildings in Milan, uh, they are including green spaces. And there are projects actually in Malta. There was a pilot project about green roofs. We have this great opportunity uh, to, to start putting this. So that's where architects, I think, have a responsibility not to just listen to the client, but also offer these solutions. And we'll tell them this will, for example, reduce your anxiety levels, which are obviously quite high in Malta. Let me just say that uh, I don't think a great activist will make you a great poet. Uh, I think poetry and activism are, you know, two quite separate things. I think that you can use poetry in activism, um, but it's. It's normally very difficult to write good poetry when you are so engaged in a in political action because you have a very clear um, goal in mind and normally poetry defies one direction uh, processes. So generally speaking, I think that there are you know, two completely separate things. On the other hand, I think we also have this problem here that we have one very, at least, you know, in the cultured circles or in the literary circles, we have a very one-dimensional idea of what poetry or literature should be. So it's meant to be this, you know, very cultured, very well, well-read sort of writing. But there is also a more popular kind of poetry, which, for example, Emmanuel has used when he when he wrote Altafiura with Nicamara, and then it's it's uh, his, his second take on it when he wrote about fuel stations, and that you know that really created um, interest. It 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 created awareness. So the two things I want to say are that uh, one being a Good poet doesn't make you a great activist. Being a great activist doesn't make you a good poet. They're two separate things. I don't think poets have to be activists. Um, I don't think uh, being activists would make, would, would make them better poets. And I don't think that they're not being po uh, activists make them, makes them any less, uh, you know, good at poetry than, than others. Uh, being, being a great poet, I think, is actually writing great poetry. Uh, that sounds, you know, banal, but I think that's basically it. Uh, but on the other hand, I also think that there, that there are different kinds of poetry, that poetry can, can have different functions, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, look down on certain more popular uses of poetry. Okay. Is there anyone else? <coughs> I think you, this should be the last because it's half past nine. I don't know. Yes, please. Um, my uh, question is about how how you um, you as uh, writers or poets avoid, if at all, uh, the uh, nostalgia in your criticism of uh, development or overdevelopment. Because uh, um, I don't know how many of uh, persons uh, sitting here would want to go back to farming on arid land uh, or fishing. And uh, I come from a culture that has a, a very long tradition of uh, writing about the demise of traditional village and uh, urban transformation, sometimes forced. And uh, um, as the person before said, that it doesn't resonate with the children. And uh, I perfectly remember this compulsive literary, uh, literature at school and feeling that Go away! You're, you're outdated. It's, uh, it, we don't want to go back to scrubbing laundry in the river. And uh, oh, we want the urban pleasures. 
Yeah, I think this is, that's something that is very relevant to to the Maltese context. Certainly, I mean, the, the books were the, the Maltese literature books that we're meant to study in school and and so on. Certainly re reflect that. I mean, I avoid it. It's not that hard for me to to avoid. Um, and I, but I'm, I'm going to speak about nostalgia in a very general, in a general sense because I find that the tensions that are inherent in all of this, that we're, all of these things that we're talking about, are enough fodder for me to 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 do the 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 work I'm doing in, in a sense, especially. The, the comic book. I mean, it sort of wrote itself in a way when when I allowed myself the freedom to do it in the in this um, in this particular mode that I chose to do it in, which is very much based on genre and, and grotesque and and uh, and I, I got lots of help from from intertextual sources and and, and, and all of these things. So I think there's yeah, that's, yeah, that's another shame. That, that's another reason why it would be a shame to 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 uh, give in to nostalgia because there's a lot of potential I think that we can exploit even as writers again talking at it from a very mer aesthetic and, and, and mercenary uh, point of view but you know you have to do do things as Adrian was saying you know activists do not necessarily make good poets so you have to engage with the material on the level of it being material on the level of craft and I think yes capitalism and uh, and, and all of its Machinations make make for very good, uh, very good fodder, certainly. Uh, yes, there's the, uh, there's a, there was a song that uh, had a line, "The good old days are good and gone now. That's why they're good because they're gone now." And um, I think you know, <coughs> avoiding nostalgia, we can have a sense of what's happened in the past. We can have a sense of those lines, those links with the past, those movements, um, those forces, those upheavals that have, that have shaped um, where we are now in the past, but not have a blanket kind of love for everything just because it was, it was like they did it in the old days, because in the old days they used to burn witches and they used to hang people in public squares and they used to beat their slaves, so that's, uh, that, that's not, we don't want to hang on to everything because it's in the past, but we do want to recognise how things have changed and why they've changed, and, and keep in touch, keep in touch with, with the roots um, uh, that have have defined us as a people and as individuals.